Hello, this is Dr. Michael Trax, and here's an update on the coronavirus situation as of March 27, 2020. We will focus this video on symptoms and what to do about them. Let us get an updated overview of the symptomatology of COVID-19. Here is a useful chart reinforcing what we have talked about before. The most common presentation of the disease is a combination of fever, present in 88% of people, and dry cough, present in 68%. The problem with this scenario is that it is not really specific to the coronavirus and can represent a case of flu as well. Many of these other symptoms, such as fatigue, muscle aches, and headache, can be present in both COVID and flu as well, so one differentiating factor is this. About 20 to 30% of COVID patients have shortness of breath either on presentation or later during the course, and that percentage is far greater than in the flu. Here's a table that tries to help patients and doctors tell the difference between COVID and the flu, as well as the common cold. As you can see again, fever and cough can be present in the more serious disease, while the common cold is more likely to cause sneezing and runny nose. Other symptoms, such as sore throat and headache, can be present in all three, but again, you can see that breathlessness is specific to COVID. To add to the confusion, the allergy season is coming up, which can mean scratchy throats and even more breathing problems in the asthmatics, but usually without high fever or body pains. With such symptom overlap, it is easier to rule out common cold or allergies, but harder to tell whether someone has COVID-19 or the flu. Add to it yet another layer. It seems that our ERs are seeing more GI symptoms as well, so diarrhea needs to be added to the mix, and now we are also starting to receive signals that one of the milder and early symptoms can be loss of smell or taste. And that's in up to 30% of people. So, what it really comes down to is that any sort of febrile illness that includes cough, fatigue, body aches, and maybe a loss of smell or diarrhea will raise suspicions for COVID. And whereas you having these symptoms three weeks ago would have made the doctors think of the flu first, now the game has changed and you have to assume COVID-19. New York is changing its approach to testing. Two or three weeks ago, the idea was to test a lot of people to identify and contain clusters of the disease. Now, the disease is widespread, so containment gives way to mitigation and ever-increasing severity of social distancing measures. In that scenario, testing becomes less important, especially since presence of the disease does not alter management of the mild cases. The hospitals are still testing the admitted patients as the presence or absence of COVID alters the isolation requirements for them, but otherwise, New York State Department of Health has stated that wholesale testing is discouraged. This may change again as time goes on. Let's take you through several scenarios. Start with a relatively young person, below the age of 60 let's say, and without any underlying conditions that I will discuss in a minute. To recall this charge, great majority of these patients will have a mild disease and are discouraged from going to the ER or even urgent care. If your symptoms of cough and fever are mild, stay home and call your doctor instead. She will tell you to drink plenty of fluids and observe your symptoms, but will not have any more firm advice than that. For the majority of you, the disease will last a course of about 7 days and get better. For persons over 60, but especially for those with underlying conditions, the severity of the disease could be somewhat greater, as seen in this graph. The initial management of these patients is the same, just stay at home and observe yourself, but here more vigilance is in order. Here's the graph representing a typical course of this illness. Symptoms start on average day 5 post-infection with a range of 2 to 14 days. The illness starts with a cough, fever, and the other symptoms we have discussed, and it sometimes tends to improve before getting worse on average day 7 or 8. That is when dyspnea, or shortness of breath, joins the previous lesser symptoms of fever and cough and the patient can get hospitalized. For those destined for mild disease, the fever and cough tend to last a little more than a week, but fatigue can last longer. To make it clear, the only patients who should be going to the ER are those who feel really ill, either at the onset of the disease or due to the relapse around day 8. This could take form of very high fever or profound fatigue, but the most important symptom that needs ER attention is shortness of breath. 
The term shortness of breath needs to be explained a little as some of my patients confuse it with nasal congestion. True shortness of breath has nothing to do with difficulty of breathing through your nose, but rather with a sensation of breathlessness, like after you've run up a flight of stairs, but at rest. Unlike the mild cases that could be healed at home, the patients with shortness of breath will likely need oxygen to feel better and are welcome in the ER. Majority of those will not need anything beyond small nasal cannula, but about a quarter of the hospitalized patients, or 5% of total infected, will need an ICU stay with potential intubation and mechanical ventilation. It is hard to hear, but that is why we have shut down all social and commercial life in the New York City area at this time. We will take care of the hospitalized patients the best way we can, but let us talk in detail what can we do at home. First, what can we do to best prepare for the possible COVID exposure? The internet is full of supplements to boost the immune system, but it is important to recognize that most of these offer hearsay evidence at best. Rather than focusing on the latest Scandinavian berry, WHO has delineated very sound advice in that regard, and it starts with wholesome food. We have all stocked our pantries with non-perishables and it will be important not to neglect fruits and vegetables during the coming weeks. Other interesting advice is to avoid alcohol as well as sugary drinks, stop smoking or vaping as that increases chances of severe disease and exercise, 30 minutes for adults and one hour for kids. That's it, that's the official advice and anything else is basically unproven slash hopeful way to make ourselves feel better. It is true that deficiencies in a host of vitamins and micronutrients like zinc can subdue the immune system, but it is through eating well and exercising, rather than pill form supplements, that you could optimize what you need. Take them to feel safer, but make sure you do not overdo on the dosage. Ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve and all other NSAIDs have made the news recently. It all started with the French health ministry issuing a warning about anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen having adverse effects on the COVID cases. The rationale here was that these drugs limit our own immune system, allowing the virus to spread. These recommendations circulated the news for about two days before WHO came out against them. In its convoluted language, WHO stated that, I quote, it does not recommend against the use of ibuprofen. What it basically means is that their no ibuprofen advice was overblown, but I would not use it myself. Why? Ibuprofen can affect kidney function in a dehydrated febrile state, and though that has nothing to do with COVID, it has everything to do with what I do for a living. So Tylenol in my house it is. It's just plain safer as long as you stick to the dosing recommendations on the bottle. As you might know by now, there is no FDA-approved tested treatment for COVID-19 as of today, but that does not mean that the doctors are just sitting on their hands. In fact, there are several medicines being used in the hospitals at this time. For now, the consensus is that mild to moderate symptoms of fever, cough, etc. do not require specific medications. Once the patient is admitted to the hospital with shortness of breath, however, few options open up. The most talked about medicine at this time is hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is a derivative of an anti-malarial drug chloroquine and is now sold under the brand name Plaquenil to treat arthritis. These drugs have been shown to work well against coronaviruses in a test tube and gained recent attention as bolstered by a sequence of reports. A letter out of China published in Bioscience Trends described that a number of Chinese trials conducted to test chloroquine in COVID-19 patients were successful. Based on these data, the drug was recommended for inclusions in the official COVID treatment guidelines in China. The issue here is that the underlying data has never been published and the scientific world at large is not convinced of the quality of the studies. The second paper in favor of hydroxychloroquine was a French study where 20 patients were treated and showed a significant reduction of the viral nasal loads when compared to non-treated patients. Problem there was that no clinical outcome data was provided, meaning we did not know if the patients did worse or better. What you see here is what we call anecdotes, hearsay reports that show the drug may have worked. Without proper randomized studies, these results are neither here nor there. 
It may have been that the people it was given to were just getting better on their own, for example. Importantly, these drugs can cause heart rhythm issues, especially when taken together with azithromycin, as it had been suggested in the French report. These cardiac issues especially affect patients with kidney or liver disease, but can happen to anyone and that is why the CDC does not recommend taking them by the general public. We live in the drastic times, however, and we do use hydroxychloroquine in the hospital. I am aware of the fact that patients take it at home, but I would like to caution everybody to talk to their doctors before they take it. Okay, so you might have COVID-19. You feel the fever, might have some cough, and do not want to spread it to your family. A recent study showed that the COVID coronavirus can stay for up to three hours in the air and survive 24 hours on cardboard and up to three days on hard surfaces. These were ideal lab conditions, of course, but still, the virus seems to be sticking around. So what can you do? CDC has made a useful guide to address this issue and here are some of their recommendations. First, you have to monitor the patient's symptoms and call their doctor if they get worse. Again, watch out for that day 8 relapse. Second, household members should stay in another room or be separated from the patient as much as possible. Household members should use a separate bedroom and bathroom if available. You should prohibit visitors who do not have an essential need to be in the home. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60 to 70% alcohol, covering all surfaces of your hands and rubbing them together until they feel dry. As always, avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth with unwashed hands. Next, the patient should wear a mask when around other people and you should throw out disposable face masks and gloves after using them. Next, you should avoid sharing household items with the patient you should not share dishes, drinking glasses, cups, utensils, towels, bedding, or other items. Finally, you should clean all high-touch surfaces such as countertops, tabletops, doorknobs, bathroom fixtures, toilets, phones, keyboards, tablets, and bedside tables every day. It may be hard to stay separated, but do the best you can. So, when are the patients with suspected COVID considered free of infection? turns out there are two protocols out there, one based on tests and the other based on symptoms. The test-based strategy asks for resolution of fever, improvement in the respiratory symptoms such as cough or shortness of breath, and two negative tests at least 24 hours apart. Clearly, there is a superior way to make sure the patient is no longer contagious, but may not be feasible in areas with high concentration of cases due to lack of testing. So. For most of us, the non-test-based strategy was developed, which includes the following criteria. The patient needs to be at least 72 hours fever and symptom-free, and at least 7 days must have passed from the first day of symptoms. This only counts for patients who are no longer on any fever suppressing medications such as Tylenol, etc., and it does not guarantee that these patients are no longer contagious, but the risk of contagion by that time would be very low. Still would not kiss grandma for at least another week after that. Complicated topic, but in a word, not likely. We have several examples of seeming reinfections, like a Japanese tour guide who tested positive on January 29, improved and tested negative on February 6, just to get sick again and test positive on February 19. There are others, but they all seem to be an exception. In our favor, we already have one study in rhesus monkeys who have a very similar immune system to humans and which shows clear production of coronavirus immunity on re-exposure. To quote the study, combined with the follow-up virologic, radiological and pathological findings, the monkeys with re-exposure showed no recurrence of COVID-19, similarly to the infected monkeys without rechallenge. This data is supported by a 2007 study that shows that SARS virus immunity was present for at least two years before waning. What this means is that those who experience COVID will likely be immune in the short term, but the duration of this immunity is not certain yet. At this point of the game, New York area is turning into an epicenter of the disease in the United States, and we will hear of more and more friends coming down with strange fevers. Know what to do. 
If you or the loved one have symptoms consistent with mild COVID, stay home and call your doctor. If symptoms get worse, present to the ER. When suspecting COVID, spend time properly isolating yourself at home. No one can really tell whether the warm weather will really help, but I have my hopes. Here is the frequency of other coronaviruses as distributed throughout the year in the Western United States. Let's just hope COVID-19 virus will follow the same path. Stay well, everybody. <laughs>